Your job is to sing. Yep. We've got these guys in a shed over there who are writing the songs. Uh, we've got Studio 3 free. We get Precisely, a song yeah. from these guys, we give it to you, and now you perform it and record it. Yep. Okay. Go, but I want to write my own... No, yeah, no, yep. you can't do that. Today I'm having a gas with Rory Sutherland, Vice Chairman of Ogilvy. And we're going to get into sonic branding, sludge content, behavioural economics, Rick Rubin, heat pumps, and a lot more than that. I hope you like it. Roderick Rory Sutherland, uh, one of the most famous people in advertising. You know our mutual friend Paul Burke? Of course. And he said... Uh, He's I mean, magnificent, Paul Burke. Wonderful, Fantastic. isn't he? Very fast yeah. and very honest. Mm. And he said, um, Rory Stewart is actually called Roderick, and I was hoping he'd become Prime Minister, because then we'd have a Prime Minister called Rod Stewart. So. Ah, no, interestingly, I didn't know this. Um, I'm christened Roderick, mm -hmm. um, and my brother, who was 18 months older than me, couldn't really say Roderick, so he said something... Bleh. And my grandmother said, oh, you should call him Rory, which I've been known by everybody, apart from my passport and my driving licence. Yeah. Uh, I've, had, I've been known as Rory ever since. And I didn't know until I met Rod, uh, Roderick stroke Rory Stewart, yeah. I didn't know that this was actually a formal abbreviation. Yeah. I thought it was just an alternative name. Yeah. But in Scotland, Rory is an abbreviation for Roderick. Wow. Um, weirdly. Um, and so likewise, yes, you're right, Rod Stewart would have been the uh, Prime Minister. <laughs> so um, the, today, uh, Rory, we do have, uh, on instruction of Anna, for the audience, Anna is the sort of the... Wh 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 which uh, hemisphere is the organised one, the right or the left? Uh, the, the, the left is the, uh, the only retentive one, yeah. Right, so Anna's your left hemisphere, you get yes, the kind of walking right. right hemisphere. So what that means is, uh, <laughs> she's going to come in and give... Ian us McGilchrist us. will be uh, turning, uh, sure it... turning red at the... Yeah, not because... in his grave, because he's still... No, no, absolutely not, no. <laughs> the Master and His Emissary, that's the book, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his most recent book is The Matter With Things, which is a two-volume sort of 1,200-page work, which I have to confess I haven't read in its entirety. But actually, I'm not sure... Uh, I'm not sure you need to read it in, its, in order. You need to read it in its entirety, but actually you can dip into it. It's extraordinary work. Reminds me of something you once said. You said there are no schedules, only checklists. Yeah, I, I don't really believe in pro creative processes. I think there are checklists which are important. Yeah, And I think, you know, have you, have you looked at this? Have you considered that? What about this? I think checklists are really useful. I think the idea that there's a necessarily a kind of procedure and order in which you proceed, if you're trying to do something original, that yeah. is, if you're trying to do something which is the same as the time you did it before, then you want a process yeah. or an algorithm. Yes. But if you're trying to do something new, uh, the best you can hope for, I think, is a checklist. Well, yeah. that's kind of the problem with trying to scale up creativity, isn't it? Which is, to scale yeah. up, you kind of have to copy and paste quite a lot. I think what we can do, and which we've, what we've failed to do in advertising, is I think we can kind of... You can't replicate it, but I think you can classify it. Right. And I think you can find recurring patterns in successful marketing campaigns, uh, which you can uh, effectively... Uh, you, can, you, you can do variations on a theme, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And I don't think... I think we need a kind of Linnaean classification of persuasive forms. I mean, all credit, actually, Bob Cialdini. I don't know if you're a fan of his book, Influence. But he was the first person to say... Uh, he, 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 he effectively went out with sales forces and said... And he found that, just to be clear, he said every sales force, every successful salesman has a whole effectively a whole panoply of different techniques and some of them are totally specific to what you're selling you know, if you're selling you know aluminium cladding or whatever it may be you'll have a shtick or a particular technique that's very effective but it's not necessarily applicable if you're selling bathroom supplies right but he said there are these six things i think he's now extended them to seven which recur from category to category. In other words, scarcity, for example, social proof. They're kind of common recurring themes which humans instinctively find reassuring, you know. Well, is scarcity as in the less there as is, the more valuable? They, what's weird about them, and I think you could probably make the case that they're kind of contradictory. In other words, not many people have this, so it must be good. Yeah, yeah. OK? Yeah. Uh, we can only produce 2,000 bottles a year, therefore it must be good. Or Coca-Cola, which is everybody drinks this, therefore so it, it must be good. good. Or like in the case you mentioned on Rick Rubin's podcast, just been listening to that this afternoon, you said in some categories like fashion, uh, what was it, if you're not selling enough, try raising the price. Mm. You know, there are some items for which you have to pay a painful amount for it to actually matter. And the, I mean, the psychology of price is really interesting because it's something that economics gets really badly wrong because it assumes that X, that cheaper is inherently better. Yeah. And it forgets the fact that price isn't just a cost, it also conveys meaning. Yeah. 
And I, well, the way I would say is to economists, price is a number, but to consumers, it's a feeling. And the example I always give is if, if you were a completely logical economist and you had two products and one of them had greater functionality, more features than the other, and it also cost less. Now, in economic terms, that's a slam dunk. It's a no-brainer. It's a really easy decision. Greater utility, lower price. You buy the cheaper, more functional product. What actually happens in the human brain is we actually have second-order intelligence, which goes, well, if my product really was better, I'd kind of charge more for it, wouldn't I? Yeah. So therefore, why is this product cheaper? Well, maybe there's something wrong with it that I don't know about. I now feel uneasy, so I'm not going to buy either of them. Right, yeah, so like, was it penicillin? If you get, you know, 62 pence is not enough. I've got a two pound... But aspirin, yeah, aspirin, was aspirin. The, aspirin was the great thing, yeah, where I said, you know, I, it worries me that there isn't any premium aspirin because yeah. the placebo effect is undoubtedly affected, by the way, but if you tell people a treatment is expensive, it does, in many cases, make it more, more effective. Which presumably a pharmaceutical clients are rolling. I mean, I mean, that's an interesting debate in itself, which is, and actually, I bizarrely I had a conversation briefly with Sir Patrick Valance, of all people. I had to give a talk at a medical uh, dinner. And I must admit, two weeks before the talk, I was kind of thinking, bunch of doctors, after dinner speech, maybe a few knob gags. Yeah. And then I had a look at the invitation list and realised it was sort of Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance and Sir Richard Thompson. I thought, OK, I think I need to raise my game a bit here. And one of the things I was delighted Patrick Valance also agreed with is that we've got the placebo effect wrong, in that to prove the efficacy of a drug, what we do is we take drug plus placebo only placebo, subtract placebo, that is efficacy of drug, because we're trying to prove the pharmacological value of the drug in isolation. But what we should be trying to do as doctors is increasing and maximising the combinatorial effect of the psychology and the, and the pharmacology. So you mean instead of yeah. minus placebo? So, so, instead of, instead of, so let's, say, let's say you do... OK, what, what's uh, something I can't get hold of at the moment, which is this, um, you know, weight loss drug that you inject into your gut called um, Ozempic, right. OK, or Wigovi. Now, what you might do is get a load of people to inject themselves with nothing and a load of people to object, uh, inject themselves with Ozempic, and you can reasonably say that the weight loss between the two is attributable to the pharmacology, not to the psychology, yeah. OK? But what we should be doing with Ozempic is saying, how do you maximise the combinatorial effect in weight loss of psychology and pharmacology? In other words, do you tell people to take Ozempic for a week and then stop and then try and not eat for three weeks and then have another dose? You know, is there a way you can make this drug, in a sense, more theatrically effective? Because part of weight loss, undoubtedly, is pure, what you might call pure endocrinology or whatever, OK? Part of weight loss is surely convincing people, providing people with a narrative that things have changed and they can actually lose weight. They can change their behaviour. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I mean, is, is there a way in which you also combine it, say, with something like sleep therapy? And so what worries me is that we're trying to prove the standalone efficacy of different drugs when really we should be looking at the multiplicative, the combinatorial maximum efficacy of three interventions, behavioural, psychological and pharmacological, yep. and saying, how can we combine those three things to maximise effective weight loss? And instead, of course, to justify a drug for approval, what you have to do is subtract all the other things that are working when you should be trying to maximise them. Right, so there's a, this reminds me of a line that always comes back into my head, which is at the end of the final Harry Potter book. Um, now, you've got, you've, got to, you've got to excuse me here. Weirdly, OK, I haven't read any Harry Potter. I had a daughter who was obsessed with it. That makes sense. I think you're the right age to have not read the books. I'm probably at that grumpy Stuart Lee age where you go, you, you've seen the Stuart yeah, Lee. Yeah, because I have read what yeah, Whitman's in You should read it, Stuart. Yeah. It's about a wizard. No, I have read the entire works of William Blake. Yeah, that was now, a Blake. fuck, fuck off. off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, OK, right. Yeah. Now, I haven't read the entire works of William Blake. I probably should have done. But, I, I, by the way, I make that mistake. I'm weirdly a bit snobby. I'm not very snobby about food. I'm as happy going to KFC as I am going to, you know, Michelin-starred restaurants. I'm weirdly snobby about cinema, and the, yeah. you know my ideal film is like some French people getting upset about something over dinner. Yeah. Okay, but I think that's. I mean, I, I actually ended up watching The Lion King, which is the kind of thing which um, the original. Uh, th this is the yeah the, the movie the cartoon. Yeah, yeah, the cartoon. Yeah. And I'm the kind of person I'm, you know 
bloody children's thing. What am I watching a bloody cartoon for? I should be yeah. watching, you know, you know, you know I, could, I, I could be watching last year at Marian Band. Yeah. Why would I watch it? And I watched it. I'm, it's fucking amazing. Brilliant. It's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. But it's drawing from the same source material. You've got Hamlet, you've got Richard the Third. Well, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And it, so it, it's it's rather like Star Wars, which draws enormously on mythology. It's right. actually yeah. extra. And actually, one of the lessons is that the best of anything is great. Yes. OK, country music. You know that thing that went down to look at the Titanic yep. and it, it imploded, OK? Well, you apparently you got to take your iPod or your Bluetooth device down and they had a Bluetooth speaker and you could choose your playlist for the journey down to the Titanic. But there was a rule, no country music. Now, that's a red that flag. Rule. That's a red that flag rule. right there, yep. OK? I'm not going to entrust my life to a guy who doesn't like country music. Because the best country music is It's, it's fantastic, yes. yeah. Look, yeah. I'll finish my Harry Potter Sorry, point. sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Harry Potter, in. sorry, back to yeah. Harry Potter. So don't, don't start talking about things like Hogwarts, because I, 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 there was this really annoying three-year period where every piece of journalism included a Harry Potter reference about yep. the sorting hat yes. or owls and our, or platform seven and three. No, 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 of, this is... And I'd be sitting there reading the Times or something. What the fuck are you yeah, this yeah. person talking How is this about? This, this is absolute attention. God. Yeah. What are you talking about, owls? But there's this dream yeah. sequence at the, mm. at the end where Harry sees a, a Dumbledore in, in a dream and he uh, gets a revelation. But he says, the problem is none of this matters because it's all in my head, so it's not real. And Dumbledore says, of course it's all in your head, but who's to say that means it's not real? Of course, of course. And this is... To your point about mm. assuming the physiological is the only real effect and the psychological is a kind of... I mean, you, I mean, we've got a huge TV at the end of the room, you can't see it, but that's a mind hack. It only produces three colours. It's species-specific. I was talking to the um, uh, uh, Department of Business and uh, Trade today about precisely this, that it's optimised for perception, it's not optimised for objective reality. You couldn't make a television that actually reproduced colours without that mind hack. It's a bit Emmanuel is... Kant would be jumping for joy. Yes, it would, absolutely, yeah. I mean, by the way, if you want a good book tip, folks, for your, your lovely readers and listeners, as well as obviously in McGilchrist, there's a book by a guy called Andy Clark called The Experience Machine. Yep. And what he does is he revives and builds on a theory that goes back to the 19th century about human perception, OK? And I think it was a chap called Hermann von Helmholtz, sort of German polymath, and I think William James, who made the point... Now, before televisions, by the way, and before digitisation, this theory must have seemed quite strange, but it makes sense in the light of technology. And the theory is that most of what we perceive as a prediction and that we use our limited bandwidth from our senses for error correction of prediction, not for generation of actual reality. Right, so, we're, yeah, we're not seeing it firsthand. No, we're, we're generating it. it. Effectively, now, if you, if you look at um, MPEGs and JPEGs, OK, the way they achieve their extraordinary data compression is that there is, a va there is an expect expected value for each pixel based on what pixel preceded it in time or what pixel is adjacent to it. And you only use data to describe the extent to which the pixel deviates from the expected value, which is a much more efficient use of data than describing each pixel in raw mode. For those of you who are digital... I mean, presumably, this isn't shooting in raw mode, is it? You're just shooting in MPEGs or... OK. Now, if you do take a picture... If I'm right here, I'm, I'm talking to the AV folks here. If you do shoot, shoot a picture in raw mode, presumably it's great for editing because there's literally a value for each pixel, but the files are insanely massive, is that right? Because I had a photographer who was my neighbour in Deal who had to come round because I had fibre optic broadband to the premises and he couldn't get it and he had to upload these raw photos. 120 it was, they're like, you know, insane sort of, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And um, I think he used to park outside my house when I wasn't there. Now, interestingly, it's much more efficient use of data to use data to error correct versus expectation than it is to use data to generate the whole image de novo from a blank slate. And what it seems to be the case is that the brain has come up with exactly the same data architecture that kind of Samsung and digital camera makers have come up with for data compression, which is just use the data to destroy... Because I, I, I don't know, I imagine if you wanted to have a TV in raw mode, OK, your sky dish would have to be the size of Jodrell Bank or something. I, I don't power know. Consumption you know power consumption would have been absolutely insane. Yeah. But they play this brilliant... Three hacks. One, you only need three colours because the brain's basically... The cones in the eye only detect those three colours. Colour mixing's a psychological phenomenon. It's yeah. not... It doesn't it's exist not in really nature. happening there. No, yeah. no. If you mix green and whatever it is, you know... Um, what is it? Green and, and red... 
Is yeah. it green and red is yellow, isn't it? If you mix green and red photons, you don't get yellow photons. You get green and red photons. But, but you're the, just brain, it as a the brain effectively extrapolates yellow yeah. from the relative strength of those two stimuli. Yeah, so the frightening conclusion is there's no such thing as yellow. No, 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 no there's no such thing as magenta, particularly. Right. Magenta is entirely... Because halfway between red and blue is green... But you're not detecting any green with your green sensors. So magenta is effectively a colour the brain generates to explain away the inexplicable absence of green. OK? Um, this, this is actually fascinating because if this... Uh, I mean, when you think about it, if um, Andy Clark and von Helmholtz... And the, the book, once again, is called The Experience Machine. If they're right about this, which I think they probably are, because it makes complete sense from a kind of data processing, mental data processing point of view, and that most of what we actually see is prediction and expectation... Um, and this may be true of movement as well. So in robotics, they've had some success by making robots move in a kind of way that's Bayesian. In other words, it's constant, it's intention combined with constant ongoing error correction rather than intention action. Yep. And it's interesting because apparently if you design robots to move in this Bayesian way, it looks much more natural and animalistic or human than it does if you actually design them to kind of do this. This is similar to the way the degrees of like light intensity is logarithmic. So if you ask your uh, That's Echo it. Dot, mm. turn the lights down by 50%, it'll feel like it's barely moved. To feel like it's half as bright, it needs to be something like 10% bright. Ah! Yeah. Now that's interesting because that's psychophysics, which is a lot of things we perceive logarithmically. According to some scientists, we perceive numbers logarithmically. So if you take an enumerate tribe, apparently, and you go and put a grain of rice down, and then you put nine grains of rice down, and you ask them to make a pile that's halfway between the two, people who've done maths, who have an actual number system, Four. put five. Yeah. But people who actually don't put three. One, three, nine. Because they see three as halfway between one and nine. Why would that be? Well, it sort of makes sense. It suddenly makes sense to me in terms of our actual perception. Yeah. Because there's a big difference between being attacked by one lion and two lions, yeah. OK? Whereas the difference between being attacked by 98 lions and 99 lions yeah. is kind of hair-splitting and rather irrelevant. Yeah. So in terms of perceiving quantity logarithmically, maybe that explains a lot of pricing, OK? You know that slightly weird thing with price, which is there are things that are expensive within the 20 to 30, 40 pound range. OK. And then I can go and spend £200 on something and it doesn't feel like that much more expensive. Yeah, yeah. I've never quite understood this. I never actually do that sort of maths where I think, well, I could buy, you know, 200 fries at McDonald's for the price of this jacket. Or you'd find, like, okay. you know, a stick of butter for £5.95, maybe not where you live, but we would find that in Salford. Oh, outrageously disgusting. Expensive. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. A pint of beer. Mm. Well, I'll have three for that price, you know, five, five no. you know, 15 quid. And so there's this whole weird thing about, A, we, our perception of price is, is comparative. Our perception of lots of things are comparative. And they're not linear. Yeah. Um, emphatically not linear at all. And so, you know, it's always, I always love American weather forecasts because they have this thing, feels like temperature. Yes. And it's, you know, well, here in Scottsdale, Arizona, it's 110. But, of course, it's really humid. So, sorry, it's really dry, so it feels like about 90-something. Yeah. And it factors in breeze, humidity, and something else, I think. There's a third factor. Uh, maybe direct sunlight, I'm not sure. But, I mean, it, it always struck me as really weird in that, as, you know, as a fat Welsh Celtic guy, OK, I don't come into work if it hits 90 degrees Fahrenheit in London. That's just, OK, forget that. I can't cope with that. But I wander around Scottsdale in Arizona when it's 100 and something. I'm as happy as Larry. Because everyone's kind of doing the same well, thing? Well, actually, it's or... a really important point for climate change, which is a lot of the climate change modelling is all about increased temperature... But actually, what you should be modelling for is increased wet bulb temperature, which is uh, temperature plus humidity. Because humans can survive quite well in low humidity at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm old. OK, I'm still using... You're still on Fahrenheit. I, I'm the, I'm the la and pence. I will be the last person using... I don't use shillings and pence. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, OK. But I'm, I'm, I'm one of the last... It, uh, it, it, I, I must be um, in Europe... The people, the rental car companies must really hate me because I, you know, Change I get into a French height. rental car. First thing I do is language English or yeah. Welsh if I'm really, really perverse. And then it says Fahrenheit miles. Okay. Yeah, I convert everything to imperial. And there's some poor German who has the car after me yeah. who has driven practically insane. But, um, 
But you know, uh, but you you can survive in in really high temperatures if there's low humidity. Right. If you have a hundred percent humidity, a really fit human being, uh, even well um, uh, well provided with liquids, well well um, not humidified. What is it? Hydrated. Hydrated. Thank you. <laughs> even well hydrated will die. Yeah. Um, by the way, I had a rant this morning. This is a complete. Um, but I'd like to know your opinion on this, actually. Which is, as you probably know, the government really wants people to get heat pumps. And what is a, a heat pump for okay. the layman? So it's a way of heating your house where, effectively, it's like a fridge in reverse. Okay. okay? It stores heat and then... So, no, it basically no? extracts heat from the outside air and actually pumps it. So just as a fridge removes heat from the fridge and pumps it out into your kitchen... Other way around. A heat pump is a bigger version of a fridge which removes heat from the air outside your house, makes the air outside your house a bit colder, makes your house a lot hotter. And, you know, one way of doing it is you replace your boiler with a heat pump and you put a great piping of water underneath your lawn because that makes it a bit more effective. Now, Britain's... Few, a few things. Because of the magic of kind of, you know, thermodynamics, yeah. OK, you actually get five times as much heat out as you put energy in. There is a, It varies depending on what the temperature difference is between outside and, out and inside. But whereas when you burn gas in a boiler to heat your house, it probably converts calorific value at about 50% into heat in the home, you actually get a sort of 300 400% bonus when you use electricity to power a heat pump. It's, I know it sounds like magic, but because it isn't generating heat like a boiler, it's extracting it and moving it from the outdoors into, a, into the indoors, it's vastly more efficient, right. even though you're using electricity, not gas. the catch? So what, well, there's the catch. But here's where... It, now, I was having a bit of a rant to these people. At the, it's not their responsibility at all. But one form of heat pump is just an air conditioning unit, OK? And if you've been in a hotel room, what you may have noticed is the air conditioning unit is also the heater. Yep. OK, and all you do is it flips some little switch, directional switch, and an air conditioning unit stops removing heat and pumping it outside and starts extracting heat from the outside and moving it inside. So an air conditioning unit is also an air-to-air -air heat pump. Now, this is what pisses me off, OK? Quite a lot of people, I think, would keep their boiler and bit by bit, like it's about 1,500, 2,000 quid to buy an air conditioning unit that'll, that'll supply a room, OK? And one year at a time, they might, get, they might go, OK, I'll air, I'll air condition the kitchen. I, I'll put an air-to-air heat pump in the kitchen. And uh, while they got three or four of these things, they'd hardly be using their boiler and their gas at all, except in really, really cold weather, OK? And you can't get a government grant for that. Why? Okay? You can get a government grant for digging up your lawn, putting huge numbers of pipes in, throwing out your gas boiler, um, replacing your radiators. You can get a government grant for doing something that's really stupid and complicated. Yep. But the simple thing, which exploits exactly that same benefit of heat transfer being very efficient, and the reason is because they said, well, if we give people air conditioning, they might use it for air conditioning, which will actually increase energy use. And I'm going, well, look, I'm a marketer, right? I can sell anybody air conditioning, which also reduces their gas bill. If I go to you and say, how would you like air conditioning? And it will also save you a couple of hundred quid a year on your heating bills. And, and by the way, you can keep your existing boiler. You don't have to have someone digging up your lawn. You just put this sort of thing with a fan outside your house and a bit of a vent thing coming in. My dad's got it, because my dad's 93. Wow. And we realised, OK, he needs air conditioning because, you know, when you're, 80, when you're 93, a real heat wave yes. could be quite dangerous, yes. OK? I mean, you, you, you know, you, you, you don't cool yourself as effectively as you, as you get older. And my dad now is at home with his air conditioning unit providing most of the heat downstairs. It's a heat pump, an air-to-air -air heat pump. It's a really easy sale. I got my dad... My dad's, you know, he's quite stingy, but I easily persuaded him to get this thing. No problem. No, 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 you can't get a grant for that. But you can get a grant for digging up your lawn, replacing your boiler, throwing that out. Well... OK, I get it, OK? There's a risk that people use it for air conditioning. Well, you could limit it so you can only use it for air conditioning when the temperature hits 24 degrees or something anyway, OK? I'm using centigrade, you notice. Um, OK, but I said, mate, you know, this is effing Britain, 
right? I get it. If I'm the Greek government, OK? Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If, I, you know, if I'm the government of Chad, OK, yeah. I don't want people installing air conditioning. I can understand that point. This is going to be, like, three, four weeks of the year at most. And you're going to cheer everyone up in that and one gonna, week I, everyone's unbearable. And also, it's, you're going you're to be able to sleep. Because, yes. you, you know, that yes. week where you can't get to sleep because you're just lying there like yeah. some character in a Graham Greene novel. And the conversation you know, just becomes that. It's just, oh, it's hot, I can't get yes, to sleep, hot, dear. Yes. No, I can't either. It's terrible, you <laughs> yeah, know. And then you have the window windows open and then it's noisy and all that sort of stuff. So my view is this is dumb because it's it's the great being the enemy of the good. Because I, mean, I always ask this question, what, why do you actually recycle your bottles at a bottle bank? Well, 20% of it is save the world, 80% of it is because smashing bottles inside a big metal container fucking is a fucking blast, <laughs> right? OK, we love it. You know, a trip to the bottle bank is basically a treat, OK? Now, if you have this one positive, which is, oh, and you get air conditioning as well, OK, I can see a load of people going, yeah, what the hell, I can keep my existing gas. I've got a bit of resilience here because I've still got a gas supply, but most of my heat, when it's economic and when there's an abundance of, you know, solar or other clean generated energy, most of it can come through electricity. whoop de doo And I'm not going to freeze to death because I've still got my gas boiler and my radiators as a fallback. I can see a million people doing that, OK? Yeah. Whereas digging up your lawn, throwing out your existing equipment, dumb. And so it's a typical case where the thing has been optimised for objective perfection, not for realistic human reality. Yeah. So it's, it's an absolutely classic case where instead of going to marketers and saying, look, Never mind what's perfect, theoretically, what can we reasonably persuade people to do? Can we persuade people who are quite rich, with bigger houses, to spend a bit of money, which, which means they'll save money quite a lot of the year heating their home, and they'll also get air conditioning if there's a horrible hot day in the summer, and they don't have to do major building works? Yeah, I can get people to do that. Mm -hmm. Can I get people to do the conventional heat pump solution? Forget about it, OK? So this is, uh, this is part of your, um, hmm. what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a, so, a trunk that runs through your thinking is counter-rationalism. Yeah, well, exactly. So don't optimise for reality and then impose it on people. Yeah. Optimise for people and then get the reality to do, you know, to do what it can. Yes. And that's my argument. It's a classic case where, you know, if you're coming up with theoretically perfect solutions which are not marketable... and. You know, if you, if you look at all the great inventors, OK, you look at Henry Ford, you look at, um, uh, well, Edison, you look at Steve Jobs, OK, they're hucksters. They're salesmen. Yes, yeah, but you they know, didn't just go, uh, I made a perfect I mean, thing. The, 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 the reason they're so it? successful is probably not because they had a comparative advantage in inventing shit, it's because they were just better at selling it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the whole history of the sort of American 19th century invention, people like Otis, who invented the elevator, were going round like state fairs and fairgrounds demonstrating these, you know, elevator cars, where, and they'd cut the cable and it would drop six inches and just stop because it, it was some super safety system. But they didn't just talk about it. They went and created a load of theatre. Yeah. And I think, I think that everybody is so keen to pretend the world works... Well, I think, if I'm being a bit McGill Christie, I think it's not just that the left brain sees the world in this kind of reductionist, some of the parts way. I don't think it's just that. I think the left brain really wants the world to be like that and wants to create a world which is like that because it feels more comfortable. But, you know, I mean, actually, I'll give you two examples of this, actually. Um, one of them I worked on a bit and the other one I had nothing to do with. But two of the... I don't know, I'd be interested in your... I'd always like to bring in the other folks. Um, two of the best ideas in the last 30 years in terms of tech products, um, the Meta Portal TV, which is basically video conferencing in HD on your television. It was about 120 quid. You plugged it into the back of your TV. It had a camera which also tracked you around the room. They went to Hollywood directors so that the camera would kind of track you and zoom into your face in a kind of brilliant, you know, artistic... Not like a kind of janky you know, computer not, not a janky computer way. It was a kind of Roger Deakins yeah, kind of, like you nice know, smooth nice thing. smooth yeah. little swoop. It's like 500 quid's worth of equipment for 100 quid, and it sits on top of your telly, and, you know, if you've got relatives on the other side of the world or, indeed, the other side of the country, you can basically kind of chat to them on your massive telly. As if they're there. As if they're there. Yep. It's extraordinary, OK? Basically failed for marketing reasons because everyone is too frightened to let Facebook put a camera in their home, yep. OK? Total marketing failure, brilliant product. But the more extreme case, which I, I, I mourn every week, Google Glass. Yes, you said it's on Absolutely sensational yeah. product, badly marketed. 
There are all kinds of reasons for the bad marketing. They launched too soon. There was some sort of weird affair between one of the Google founders. It was like 2011, founders. wasn't it? It was way before but any of it's this. it's still necessary, AI. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the watch is stupid because I, I've got to do something to see the time. If I just had a little device which occasionally said, this email's come in, you can ignore it, but it might be important. Mm. This is your next meeting. This is the time. Yep. You have 10 minutes. Turn left, okay? Which just gave me small... It didn't need to have a camera on the front that recorded. That was dumb. Yep. And also, they gave it to a load of developers first who, you know, without dissing, you know, techies. They're a certain type. They're, they're a certain type. So then you had the glass holes kind of, or glass holes kind of, you know, opprobrium. But it was, a, I still think that product, I mean, someone, because people don't understand marketing, they go, oh, that product didn't succeed. I think that product was brilliant. I think it was just badly marketed. Well, I mean, you were saying this about video conferencing for years, but th there's something else that I want to pull you onto here because it, it, it dovetails nicely. So Google Glass, my fear for something like that would be, so, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you here, but I can also have emails come up in my heads-up display, so I'm a bit distracted over here, and then maybe I can have, a, there's an advert going on down there. Have you heard of sludge content? No, well, I know about sludge, which, which is the opposite of nudge, generally. What's that? It, that's, it's a bit similar to dark patterns in design of interfaces. Dark patterns, okay, right. Dark patterns are kind of where you make it really easy to do the highly profitable thing and really difficult to, say, cancel your subscription. Oh, to. yeah, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, right, yeah, we're going to yeah, get yeah. onto that in a minute. Mm. But, so, this, I'm going to, uh, Chris is going to be annoyed at me now because I'm going to be showing Rory something on my phone. Okay, but, well, so, I'm sure we can have a nice inset appearing in the... Yeah. This, this is sludge content, so let's see if I'll, I'll just get your Yo, reaction to it. you know every single odd number has an E in it? Damn. Damn. Chains? Are you high again? No. Wait a minute, bruh. Since you were born deaf, what lang- What do you make of that? Well, okay, so you've got- you're not controlling that character at the bottom, it's just running around jumping. Absolutely, that's just on- that's a TikTok video. So what's it designed- okay, tell me what it's designed to do. What's the- The way it was explained to me was, two completely unrelated videos mm. mean you, means your visual brain can never get bored. Oh, I see. Something else just to take your mind off things if you get a tiny bit bored for a second. That explains a very interesting thing, which is one of the things that really annoys me about the um, back-to-the-office movement, OK, is I sit at home, I've got a 55-inch um, 4K TV, which I use as a monitor, affixed to the wall in front of the desk. Yep. I've got a laptop screen, I've got a professional webcam, and I come into the office and they basically give it, say, here's your plug and here's a chair. Okay. Now, one thing we know about productivity apparently is that multiple monitors oh, yeah. are an absolute productivity booster. Okay. And yet, what we're doing is we're doing this hot desking thing where people sit. I'm 58. Okay. One of the things that really drives me crazy is mobile phone. I mean, a lot of older people use a tablet basically as a mobile phone. Yeah. Because the mobile phone is too damn small and fiddly, unless you have good fat finger design. The mobile phone for people over a certain age is just too fiddly and difficult to read. And, you know, you know I always find it weird that my kids were like, book a flight on a mobile phone. I guess yeah. if I tried to book a flight on a mobile phone, I'd end up in Addis Ababa at 2 a.m. on it's a Wednesday. Like it feels a bit too small to be doing and it, that. And also, also, of course, it makes the choice architecture more painful because on a good web page mm -hmm. you can make choose from 12 options then another page on you've chosen from another 12 you've now got one out of 144 options in two clicks yeah. in a mobile phone it either involves a lot of scrolling or a hell of a lot of clicking before you actually get to what you want yeah. so there are all sorts of reasons why the big i mean i find kids weird like this i mean well you know i mean you know, when I, all through the 70s, 80s, you know, 90s, how big is your TV? Let's watch this on a bigger screen. Wow, it's IMAX, OK? Yeah. And i got my fucking 22-year-old kids going, ooh, I can watch this on a thing the size of a fucking letterbox. Yeah, totally. What was all that about? Lovely story about that, by the way, which is totally irrelevant, but um, uh, people always talked about how big their television was, I mean, literally through the 50s and 60s. And Kenneth Williams' mum and the Carry On films uh, was clearly the person from whom Kenneth Williams got his sense of smut. Was he the I same? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And he, um, so Kenneth Williams' mum is sitting backstage waiting for some filming of one of the Carry On films to finish. And, uh, so what television have you got? 
Uh, she asked her friend, you know, we've just bought a 14-inch console. And Kenneth Williams' mum said, 14 inches, that's enough to console anyone. Oh, okay. So clearly, <laughs> clearly the sort of genetic theory of smut, I think, which is that uh, it was uh, kind of... Uh, I, I don't think... Uh, I, I think his mum was probably a major contributory factor to... Uh, Seems likely, doesn't it? But, it uh, does, doesn't it? Look, can I pull you onto something completely different? Why do you think we're under-exploiting sonic branding? Uh... Well, Mark Ritson has some very good data which shows that... I'm always interested, OK, in that the best of something which is underrated, that's where to go. Right. If you're buying property, if you're buying drink, go and find the th a category that's underrated and then find the best thing within that category. It's Example. in gaming the system. Well, country music would be a very good example. Sherry, an alcoholic drink. Underrated, okay. find the best. Yeah, exactly. If, if you try and buy great wine, it, you can buy great wine. It costs an absolute fortune, OK? If you want to buy great sherry, it's probably 50% more than the average sherry. Yeah. And so you get this over-concentration... I said this with Rick Rubin, actually. There are various musical genres, and it's considered high status to dismiss... The two that were first to be dismissed are typically heavy metal and country. Yeah. Not, and that's because of the user imagery. It's nothing to do with the actual inherent quality of the music itself. Mm, so because it's associated with... It's country, associated with cowboy metal hats, hats or and, cowboy hats yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But the country music is kind of music. Oh, it's, it's uh, outstanding. Music. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. My Church by Marin Morris is a recommendation for, for everyone. So I went to a mastering studio in New Jersey ah. over, the over the summer. Chris Geringer uh, was the chap who showed me around. And uh, it's an amazing thing, because he's got this million-dollar room just for making records sound perfect, kind of at the end of the factory process. It's like Gorgeous. shining it, and yeah. yeah. And he's like, well, what do you want to listen to? And I was like, uh, just show me what you've got. And he goes, listen to some of this, and puts on Marin Morris. Amazing country music. You can have it, you know, just really, really loud. And you're like, it's probably one of the best days of my life. Of course know? it is. A million-dollar sound system for country music. And so Sherry would be another point. And so one of the things I think that advertising and marketing people get wrong is go and find the things that nobody else does and do them well. Right. And a um, um, friend of mine, Graham Fink, yeah, uh, yeah. brilliant, brilliant creative. You should be a face, didn't absolutely he? Absolutely right. You should interview him. He's a neighbour of mine in Deal, so I go out to dinner with him quite a bit. I'll send him this. But clip. he said he started his whole career because he said nobody wanted to do the radio ads. Ah. Now, the interesting same thing. Same as Paul Burke. Paul Burke, exactly the same. Nobody wanted to do the radio, particularly in the UK, because we didn't have a long tradition of commercial radio as in the US. Too much BBC compared um, to the US. I mean, interestingly, the whole film Convoy, uh, the whole Convoy thing, yep. is, was actually created by something, is it BJ McCall, who was actually an advertising copywriter who created the character, who then created the song, which actually then... Is that the we are done a convoy? convoy. Exactly, da, 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 yeah. So that, that, the, the entire origins of that are kind of... Because I think he used to... Rec if I'm right, he used to... Um, quite, a lot of the, quite a lot of the copywriters would actually record their own stuff as well, I mean, oh, in cool. some cases. But Graham Fink spotted two things, one of which is you got to work with incredible talent because you could get amazing actors to appear in a radio ad for a fraction of the cost of appearing in TV. So you got to work with amazing talent. If you just put a little bit of extra money and love in, it made a really big difference. And also, a good radio ad was a lot more surprising to the consumer than a good TV ad. Yeah. You know, it had that kind of, oh, I wasn't expecting that. That's actually a really great ad, yeah. you know. Um, and so finding that, that, that game theory approach, which is find what's underrated and then do it well. And two of the things, I think, which are completely uh, underexploited, certainly Ritson says this, sonic branding of any kind, uh, where you effectively associate the brand and you give it a certain distinctiveness of noise. Yeah. Now, it's interesting to note that Netflix and HBO and more recently ITVX have all created a really, really distinctive... Yeah. Uh, one of them's called, I think, Silent Angel. The other one's probably called Tadum. I'm yes. not quite sure. Yeah, it's called something like that. Yeah, yeah. Tadum. Yeah. OK, those things actually have an, a, 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 effectively a kind of... You know, I think a connection to the amygdala that is much, much stronger than we give credit to. Yep. And there's an argument that, you know, some great ads, you've actually started with the, with the music and yep. built the ad around it, yep. in a sense. I mean, you know, a lot of the great Levi stuff was track dependent. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, 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 the 90s I mean, stuff. It's always worth asking that question. There was a guy called Neil French who was creative director of WPP in Ogilvy. And first of all, he asked everybody in the sort of creative community in Ogilvy, what is your favourite sort of one minute of film in the whole of the films you've seen? It was Zulu, wasn't it? Uh, it, might, it might well have been, actually, the singing, yeah. You're absolutely right. 
And he pointed out that actually in the vast majority of them there was music. Yes. Um, he used to do a thing which got him into huge trouble, which is he'd, he'd show uh, the seven dwarfs uh, with Hi Ho, and then he'd show the same footage with the Horse Vessel song. And of course, you know, if you have a Nazi marching song versus a, you know, wow. a Disney song, it comes across completely differently. Yep. Okay. The whole meaning of the thing is changed by the, the, the music. Yep. Um, One of the risks with Sonic branding, I don't know if you've noticed, a lot of them tend to devolve into the same kind of PlayStation startup sound with like a single piano note, uh, an impact, and some nice pads. Yes. So it's hard to get it somewhere away from that. And also whistling tends to be quite effective as well. Oh, I mean, I mean, I think ITV's done quite a good job with ITVX. I think yep. they've done, they've, they've, they've got into the zone there. The other thing that's hugely underrated, we've got a company here uh, in the building uh, called Mando Connect, which is one of the very few companies to specialise in, as, and Ritson says this, brand partnerships. Aston Martin, James Bond. We yeah, think you, you, exactly. Yeah, and that's probably the, you know one of the most exalted ones. But they generally are extraordinarily cost effective, which is probably why they get um, neglected. Right. So there's always there's always this problem with the human brain, which is we think that we pay attention to what's important, but actually we think important what we're paying attention to. Yes. It kind of works in both directions. Yeah. And the very fact that something gains our attention gives it importance. And this is usually why a lot of the big problems in history come from left field where you're not looking. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's focused on what, what they think is important. Yeah, no one saw 9-11 and no, or no, COVID. No one, no one sees 9-11 coming, no one sees COVID coming, etc. Yeah. And so, so our attention is, in a sense, you know, it's, it's, um, it can be a kind of feedback, d distorting feedback loop. Yeah. And one of the things I think that happens in marketing is that we pay a lot of attention to the things that are expensive. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so that gets all our attention. So we automatically assume the TV commercial must be massively important. Yeah. Whereas, you know, brand um, brand partnerships, you know, they don't cost very much to do. So your budget's tiny. So you don't really worry about it very much. Yeah. And so you have this fundamental... I think that happened to radio advertising. It was partly considered unimportant because it was cheap, yeah. really. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not being paid by the Radio Advertising Bureau to say this, but in all the time I've worked in this business, I've never really seen a case where radio advertising doesn't work pretty well. The business is kind of painful in an age of management consultants and engineers because one of my favourite phrases is it's from, you know, the greatest expert in kind of productivity and output uh, of the 20th century, a guy called W. Edwards Deming, who just said, to optimise the whole, you have to sub-optimise the parts. And what people try and do with ads is they try and make every component of it work as hard as possible. Oh, yeah, you've on been the in a voiceover. That, that will make the overall ad the most effective. Yes. But actually, there's a role for white space in press ads, there's a role for silence in TV ads. Yep. You know, um, there's a role for just having a period of music before someone starts talking. My co-producer, Aaron Bentley, at Gas Music, went to jazz college and he said they told him one of the most valuable pieces of advice there ever. He said, not every bar needs to be a work of genius. No, interesting. You know, have you yeah. been in a voiceover yeah. session where they, mm. what would you say, um, put every single word under scrutiny? Can you say, it, you know, lifts with a bit more Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, but the, the gestalt is what's important. The whole is what's important. So you're saying don't try and optimise all the little parts. There, there's a fantastic scene in The Trip, which yeah. has Steve Coogan and Rob uh, Bryden, Rob Bryden uh, talking about basically about advertising voiceover work and also, t what is it, TV continuity announcement. That's pretty, uh, yes. They had that one little thing, wasn't it, with... Um, uh, apparently it drives the actor Trevor Eve. Was it Desperate Measures with Trevor Eve coming soon to... And, and he said, you know, when it, if it's BBC Two, you need to give a sense of homecoming. Coming soon to BBC Two. Right. And then it's ITV, it's all right. Desperate Measures with Trevor right. Eve coming right. And the whole thing about the tonality of the whole is what really... And, of course, it's... It's very difficult. You, you, it, it seems very easy to talk about the individual word and the cadence on the individual word, but actually it's the whole that conveys yeah. the meaning. I mean, I, the most extreme case of that, of course, which always fascinates the hell out of me, is song lyrics, treating song lyrics as standalone pieces of writing. OK, so the, 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 the first one is... Um, uh, I love it when you get a really anally retentive person who points out that if you take, for example, I shot a man in Reno just to, to see, see him die. die. And, and someone points out, well, why then are you in... Is it San Quentin, isn't it, the jail? Yeah, OK. Because surely if you shot a man in Reno, you'd be dealt with by the um, uh, Nevada. 
um, <laughs> penitentiary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Nevada criminal justice system would take your case unless there was some interstate element to your crime, OK? Yeah. And picking, picking the details apart, or the fact that... Um, uh, it's a very funny thing. One of my favourite songs of all time is The Day Before You Came by ABBA, their last ever song, which only got to number, number 17. And it's kind of like this weird masterpiece. But... <laughs> You can change the entire meaning of the song if you suggest that it's someone giving evidence of their movements in response to a police inquiry. Okay? Right. You know, I, um, yeah, yeah. I must have left my work about, you know, my desk about a quarter after five or whatever it was. And, um, uh, but it has a complete inconsistency because she stops at about six o'clock to get a Chinese, some Chinese food to go and then she only gets home at eight. Right. And there are a load of sort of alien attentive people going, well, either the Swedish Chinese restaurants are unbelievably inefficient yes. or she was up to no good for those two hours. <laughs> you, two hours are unaccounted for. And yet, was it Anietta Falstog? I can't remember which one's singing, OK? These two hours, Miss Falstog, are clearly unaccounted for. Yeah. But what's interesting about that is you then take songs, literally... You know, like, I mean, you know, um, uh, for example, you know, um, Sex Bomb with Tom Jones. Words are totally meaningless, yeah. OK, if you look, look at them purely as words. But if you put them in a song and you get Tom to sing them, you know exactly what Tom means. Yeah. OK, spy on me, baby, you sat... What the... You think it would be different with a different singer? It would have different meaning? You, nothing would replace... I mean, come on, well, you can't know, be reasonable. Of course, yeah. OK, you know, <laughs> nothing could possibly replace Tom. Of course, No. Of course. Um, uh, and um, But it, it is, it's fascinating because there's the whole question of... This is very Ian McGilchrist, you know, the whole rather than the component part. Yeah. And it's probably a bit of a problem where in various uh, art forms, specialisms and silos have taken over to such an extent that, you, and it happens in business, where people are not responsible, very few people are responsible for the business and the value it creates. Yeah. Instead, they're optimising this component part to which they've been charged the with responsibility. It's the same in pop song production. Someone yeah. writes the lyrics, then mm. someone produces a demo, and then someone has to change it. Someone has to obviously perform it. Someone has to mix it afterwards and then master. So you've got this well, long production line. Well, when you think about it, it makes no sense at all, right, that 50% of the world's best songwriters are singer-songwriters. Yeah. OK? That shouldn't happen. But they're performing it, right? it themselves. They're performing it themselves. You'd think it was Dylan, all OK, Irving Dylan, Berlin, the then. Beatles, the Stones, OK? Yeah. You'd think... Now, obviously, OK, if you take two absolutely brilliant songwriters, Lieber and Stoller, yeah. OK, I think it's fair to say that two balding middle-aged guys with horn-ring specs yep. probably would have had trouble getting Hound Dog into the top but That's 20. why they hated the Beatles at the time, wasn't it? It's like these kids, these fucking kids are getting well, into the charts and writing appara the songs. Apparently you had the problem because Motown adhered to this kind of production production line Detroit Factory. system. Yeah. They were trying to stop Michael Jackson writing music, basically. They were saying, no, 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 you sing. <laughs> yeah. okay? you're, you're, I, I know this is probably not the most... But, you know, um, but you, your job is to sing. Yep. We've got these guys in a shed over there who are writing the songs. Uh, we've got Studio 3 free. We get a song from these guys, we give it to you, and now you perform it and record it. Yep. Okay. Go, but I want to write my own... No, yeah, no, yep. you can't do that. Well, no. this, this, this is probably like, in, your, in your world of thinking, isn't it? It's like when something... When the what this apparatus isn't quite ready for uh, uh, the new arrival. So Elvis Presley is what I'm thinking of, was treated the way they knew how to treat singers then. Not like the Beatles, where he's a rock star who tours, but no. we, we need to put him in films and get his I songs know. in the films. And Interesting. Yeah. They, they treated him more like a movie star than like a rock star, because the rock star was not an archetype that existed yet. No, I suppose actually I, well, a few of the Beatles acknowledged that, didn't they? That without Elvis... There would be no Beatles. There would be yeah. no Beatles, yeah. But, yeah, so he's the first rock star and uh, as a result was kind of crucified on doing croony... Doing croony films. The, yeah, exactly that. My brother-in-law's a script writer for variously sort of Silent Witness yeah. and Waking the Dead and so forth. And he said, of course, the whole thing is based on a complete pretense, which is that forensic scientists investigate crimes... Right, yeah. ..and get majorly involved in driving around the place, you know, breaking into people's homes. Yeah, they're not... They're not, uh, they're <laughs> Not uh, what they what are they called? They're not actually the um, C CID. Is that what you call it? No, no, no. They're, they're purely there as a support function. Just an analyst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. Process but, this. But form. obviously that wouldn't make very good television. In right. fairness, if they weren't allowed to leave the was it the Lyle Laboratory or whatever, oh, that, yeah. you know? Okay, if they weren't allowed to leave. They said, oh, we've just had something come in. Yeah. Oh look, here's an envelope. You know, that wouldn't make great television. Well, so you should watch Air Crash Investigation. Oh, uh, no, can like I tell that. you a very funny story about yeah. this? My wife occasionally accuses me with some justification of not always, but under certain circumstances, 
of being totally insensitive. <laughs> like, you know, you pushed in front of that woman with a push chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, for about two years, there was this thing which was an app on your laptop. And at the time, I had like a 17 inch MacBook Pro, enormous screen. Yeah. And you could get the Sky app. And you could download anything that you were entitled to watch on Sky. You could download to your laptop and then watch it, OK? And with this 17-inch screen, for about six months until I suddenly had an epiphany, I used to watch Air Crush Investigation on a plane. No way. Right? OK, OK. And I was sitting there, and of course, what you know, actually, it's particularly true in business class where the people aren't choosing to fly, OK? About one in three people... One in one in four are shit scared of flying. There are people who are just frightened on takeoff and landing, and yep. there are people who literally spend the entire flight yep. in a state of terror. Okay, and I was sitting there, and there was like a picture of like the wreckage of a seven four seven strewn over a Japanese thing, or <laughs> effectively, you know, the the the. Uh, Reenactment of a of a plane going into stall before, yeah. and then you know, then there was the black box being retrieved from 300 feet below the water surface. And I was watching all this stuff. I, I'm not remotely frightened of flying. I'm a bit weirdly, I'm a tiny bit more frightened than I was. Mm -hmm. But uh, it happens fascinatingly. I had a friend in the Foreign Office, and there are people who spend their entire working lives basically flying all over the place, yeah. not a care in the world. And at the age of something like 55. They basically feel their lucks run out yeah. and they suddenly become Nine really, lives. really nervous flyers. But I was sitting there with a 17 inch screen with air crash investigation on. Didn't occur to me, and this is a fair point to my wife, that there are occasions where I'm just totally insensitive. I mean, there are certain, there are certain there's a bit of me where um, Larry David, um, yep. Curb Your Enthusiasm, and I actually brought my wife in and said, You've got to watch this because if you watch this, you'll understand me. Yep. Where, funnily enough. How long into the marriage was that? Um, the, the, <laughs> Well, what, what, what happens in the scene? Oh, I can imagine myself doing... So Larry's wife is on a plane that's going through a really dangerous thunderstorm and is about to crash, and she manages to get the flown to basically say, Larry, Larry, I'm not sure we're going to make it. Larry's got the cable guy there trying to repair the cable TV, and he wants to know where the warranty card <laughs> is, OK, for, for the cable box, OK. And he's going, yeah, 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 yeah. And she comes back and then says, I'm sorry, Larry, I'm leaving. You're just totally insensitive. I was there, you know, thinking I was going to die. And you basically... Now, I said to my wife, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I can completely imagine myself yeah. doing that. Yeah. You know, I've finally got the cable guy to come out. You know, there's this problem where he can't watch the basketball because it keeps going fuzzy, OK? And I would become totally fixated on that problem to the extent of ignoring the context of any other kind of problem. And that's what I was doing when I was watching uh, Air Crash Investigation. I just love the reenactments where they basically, uh, you know, they write on a whiteboard, like, fuselage, question mark? Yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> what, a, a part of something, yeah. yeah. There's usually, what is it, they're flapperons, ailerons, etc. Yeah. yeah. But YouTube Premium, you get better video quality, it remembers what you've last watched, I think it, it improves the recommendations. It's, it seems like a lot of money, because... Unlike Netflix, you can watch it for free. Yeah. Okay? So, but at the same time, it's kind of kind of the last thing I'd give up if I if I went bust. It'd be the last subscription to go. I that's think. a that's a much better way of mm. looking at it because, like mm. you say, there is a weird psychological thing with the fact that it most it seems like it's always free. So why would I ever no, pay for absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and actually, and also they're trying to hammer it with adverts on the free version. YouTube, you know? what, one, what one has to say is that um, uh, you know I said this today uh, to somebody else in in sort of in the government said schools have to teach videography now it's yep. a basic form of literacy yep. being able to film yourself record yourself and just understanding the grammar of filmmaking yep. and, and in fairness with youtube it doesn't have to be you know it doesn't have to be roger deakins no. right you know but if you've got basic competence in narrative storytelling and yep. filmmaking that's really what you need and actually i'm gonna i'm gonna say also um you know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I think, and this is, I'd be interested to know what Ian McGilchrist thought of this. I think one of the one of the reasons I'm a huge um, Zoom fan and video conferencing fan is that before we had the pandemic and we had video conferencing, too much exchange was textual. 
Right. Okay. There's a huge, if you think about it, conversation is probably, human face-to-face -face conversation is, well, you know, I mean, you could argue it's kind of millions of years old if you go back to kind of primates, but it's definitely hundreds of thousands of years old. Reading is about 7,000 years old. It's, yeah. you know. And everyone reading is about 100 years old. It's a very similar thing to dogs. Uh, the human domestication of dogs happened like 100,000 years ago, and cats is like 4,000 years ago. Right. That's why you get greater variety. I mean, there is an argument that dogs actually selected for humans because if a dog liked you we've been bred by dogs just as much as dogs have been bred by humans because if a dog liked you it conferred a huge advantage on you for survival purposes of course yeah because human plus dog is kind is of that like why a... in i am legend he has a dog well there's an argument there's a really extreme argument which i don't know where it comes from but somebody mentioned that their wife at the university of bath was involved in this theory that humans at their worst their lowest ebb of human population it, the population was down to about 8000 breeding pairs sometime during the ice age and the theory was that the people who survived were the people who domesticated dogs wow and because, you know, if you think about the combinatorial advantage of human plus dog as a hunting machine, plus warmth, all those kind of things, the ability to make fire, cook food, etc., it's an unbelievable bit of symbiosis. That's amazing. Um, but in a, in a way, I think going back to conversa open ended conversation and away from like PowerPoint and writing, part of the else, we can speak much, much faster than we can. Right. Yep. Okay. So writing obviously makes sense if you're dealing with an audience of thousands because you can read faster than you can listen. Yeah. Okay. So there is an advantage to the consumer in reading things, but in writing things. And then what was happening, I think, before Zoom came along? This is again the whole question about the the the, the parts and the whole. It seems really efficient sending an email. You get something off your back. You press send. It's gone. It doesn't cost you anything. It's instantaneous. Okay. But if you think of a, a conversation where you're clearing up where you're going to meet in a pub one evening, OK, if you do it over the phone or by Zoom, OK, you arrive at a conclusion within about four minutes. I can't do Wednesday. What about so-and-so? I don't know. Oh, the crown's closed. Let's go there. Okay. On email, it's exclusive. On email, it will, be, it will literally stretch out over days. Yes. You know, there are whole things which are a living nightmare, like conveyancing and moving house in the UK, because everything happens sequentially. OK, rather than simultaneously. And by bringing back what you might call synchronous decision-making and synchronous conversation. Yeah. Now, this is one thing that really fascinates me, right? OK, so you get these businesses and you get articles in The Telegraph and The Times which say, everybody must get back into the office. This working from home thing is a fucking disgrace. You know, I can't imagine it. Uh, you know, I mean, someone was, someone, I won't name them, but quite senior in this organisation, was driven practically insane because the chief executive of Sainsbury's told them that Friday is their new Saturday. And, of course, this person is suddenly thinking all my staff, when they're supposed to be working, are going shopping. Well, actually, the truth is they probably are, but maybe they started work an hour and a half earlier in the day and they're going to work in the evening. Yeah. So actually going off to shop in the middle of the day isn't a daft use of your time if all you're going to do is email stuff anyway. But here's the thing that strikes me. There's unbelievable what you might call Puritanism bias in this, which is that businesses have introduced loads of things which are real productivity killers, like email, for example. Really, really, you know, the fact that people don't have multiple screens, the fact that you have hot desking, the fact that nobody has an office, open plan offices, all these things have been introduced which are empirically really disastrous for productivity. But no one cared because the employees didn't like them. OK? But then you come up with flexible working, OK, which employees actually enjoy, and suddenly there's this, oh, no, this can't be allowed to happen. Yeah. That, that literally is evidence of people going, I don't know whether my people are productive or not, but if they're happy, I'm probably doing something wrong. Yeah. That is literally yeah. the most extraordinary zero-sum thinking you can possibly imagine. Yeah. Because you know, nobody cared about flat hot desking because... Staff didn't like it. Nobody cared about getting rid of offices. Staff didn't like it. Nobody cared about email suddenly going on because everybody's really busy with their email. The yeah. fact that they're being totally ineffectual doesn't really matter. No, staff don't really like email, so that's fine. We'll just introduce this. The second you then introduce a potential productivity booster which saves you a fortune and the staff really enjoy, it's treated with massive suspicion. Yeah. That's absurd. Well, I don't know how... I don't know how that's like saying these car that. things, they're terrible. Yes. Because people prefer 
prefer them to walking. Yeah. We must get rid of this car yeah. thing because, look, people won't walk anymore. But there's, you know. there's that, I remember well thinking about being at very early primary school. It's kind of insane that we start people at five, six years old and say, sit down for 15 years. No, but, in, in Finland, you don't start. They have huge rates of literacy. Yeah. Uh, unbelievably high rates of general readership in Finland. And they start at seven, I think, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, there, but there's this, oh, I'm there's, sorry, the bloody phone's going. I will just have to... Hi, can I call you back in about 20 minutes? The chief exec of Coca-Cola. <laughs> Where are you now? 15. Cool. OK, I'll, I'll be leaving in about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, I think. Excellent. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. OK, lots of love. Bye-bye, lots of love. Bye-bye. Mrs Sutherland. Or... Yeah, that was Mrs S. Yeah. <laughs> She's probably, you know, accusing me of being insensitive again. I can't <laughs> wait to retire, cos I... I, I um, uh, there are various really, really mischievous things I want to introduce, which I don't believe, but they're worth... It's rather like comedy. They're, they're worth saying just because there's a bit of truth in them. And um, uh, no, I, I was always saying about the, the, relative, uh, the relative work done by men and women in the household, and you always get these statistics saying, you know, 70% of domestic chores are performed by women. But I do find out that that's because if we try doing them, we're told we're doing it wrong, OK? <laughs> this crap, by the way, do you do this business of separating whites and colours? What the fuck's all that about, right? <laughs> so if, I, I've if, been if doing it's that mine, since day one. If it, OK, if it's my shirt, it goes in the fucking washing machine. Yeah. If it's got a leak all over the bloody place, I don't want it, I'll chuck it out. You've right. said this about dishwasher safe stuff as well, right? It's like, yeah. if it doesn't go in the dishwasher, I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> no, it's, it's by definition it's dishwasher proof because my dishwasher will kill off everything that isn't dishwasher proof <laughs> and it's dishwasher Darwinism, OK? Everything <laughs> I own will be dishwasher proof if you put it all through the dishwasher, right? Yep. This whites and colours thing, what the fuck is that all about? You know? I'll finish my dubstep story because I forgot... OK, a dubstep, yeah. yeah. So Back to dubstep. <laughs> it was a Not YouTube documentary that, yeah. that was mm. saying that the 2007 smoking ban changed the nature of DJ sets because... Before that, you could find a spot in the room and smoke away if you were a smoker, and the DJ could take you on this journey that starts off soft at about 11 p.m., peaks at about 1 a.m., it's big energy, and then starts to take yeah. off after that. Yeah. So like, you can't do that anymore because everyone's dipping in and out for cigarettes all the time, so it has to be constant climax all the time, which has taken the sort of narrative shape out of it. So there's actually a theory about smoking, because are there... <laughs> This, this business, OK, where... And this is what's really, really interesting, is the extent to which really trivial, seemingly trivial, apparently unrelated or tangential things have a massive bearing on what actually happens in something. I mean, there's a whole theory about... Um, uh, some forms of American music, which is there to do with the rhythm of the railway train. Isn't Interesting, that? yeah. Because yeah, the idea was that people would be spending a lot of time going da dump, da dump, da dump, da dump, yeah. and that actually, you know, the American railways had an effect on American music. Right, I, yeah. I, I have read that quite seriously. And then, I mean, <laughs> by the way, um, we have uh, Hitler's v v uh, extremely. Uh, strongly held anti-smoking views yes. to thank for the fact that the Germans lost World War II because <laughs> Hitler had two real peculiarities, apparently, when he was in this bunker in... It's in what is now Poland, um, the, the, the... What was it? The Wolf's Lair or whatever it was called. Um, we have two cafes here. One of them's on the ground floor and the other one's right at the top. And I wanted them called the Wolf's Lair and the Eagle's Nest. Okay. But for some reason, people thought that was politically un <laughs> incorrect. But, but, um, the, um, but, but when he was in this bunker, the two things were he was obsessed with a really low temperature. And so the place was literally, it was sort of, I'll try and do, I won't do centigrade. I'll do, it was like 50 degrees, yep. OK? And secondly, there was a complete smoking ban. OK, in the, in the kind of map room. And so you had all these incredibly able German generals who spent most of the time standing outside, having a tab, yeah. and trying to warm themselves like up. It, like it was a rain. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was indoors on his own, yeah. basically going, oh, uh, let's not bother with Moscow, we'll go to Stalingrad. <laughs> OK? Yeah. So, I mean... The, the very... Churchill would allow cigars. Uh, no, 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 I don't, I don't think there was any non-smoking, or indeed non-drinking. I don't <laughs> yeah. think there were many impositions on uh, drink or smoking in... Uh, uh, in, in, in the cabinet war rooms, yeah. I imagine they was pretty happy tabbing away. But no, it is it is funny how these extraordinary things come along, which are oblique. And I kept and, and one of the reasons I think we're slow to pick up the importance is that we're not calibrated yet 
to see their overall effects. So one of the one of the questions I keep asking, I asked this of the great people at Procter and Gamble two days ago in Switzerland. I said, you're having a debate about flexible working, okay? And the whole discussion revolves around do we want our staff to work flexibly because you know they might be two percent less productive or we might lose serendipity. I said, there's actually a much bigger question here, which is do you want your customers, or your consumers, to be able to work flexibly? Because if you allow over 5, 10, 15 years a degree of flexible working, people can live where they want, they can spend much less of their disposable income on transport and less of their disposable income on housing and accommodation. So, I mean, one of the things you can do, OK, you're based in Manchester, we've had, what, four Zoom calls for every physical meeting, yes. OK? And... You know, we probably wouldn't have had the physical meeting without the Zoom calls. So you can, you know, the, the need for you to move to, I know Chris Williamson's moved to Austin, Texas, but the need for you to move to London is trivial now. It's pointless, right? Whereas, let's be honest, you know, 10 years ago, you know, you probably had to move to London if you wanted to do what you did. Well, uh, someone was saying to me the other day, they, they were still saying from BBC Creative, they're saying you still have to be in London to have those moments where you're in 750 MPH with Sam Ashwell who can turn around and say, there's an industry party tonight and all the agencies are going. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then they all climb in together and then that's where deals are sometimes done. What we actually need is micro-housing in London right. so people can spend a large part of their time somewhere else. I would, I would, I would adore I'd, it. I'd buy a micro-house like in London like a shot. I've got, I've got a... Small, uh, well, not that small, small flat in Deal, slightly larger flat near Seven Oaks. Yep. The only property I'd ever buy in London would literally be like a micro hotel room. Yeah. You know, microwave, toilet, shower, bit of a telly. Somewhere to stay. And Someone to crash. But yeah. I'm what, also, why do you want a big house in London? Because what's the point of being in London if you're going to be out indoors? I yeah. mean, you know, and all these people digging down and building a cinema room and a pool. As someone said in The Spectator, look, if you want a pool and a cinema room, that's what Surrey is for. Yeah, exactly. Right? Don't, you know, don't try and build it into some Chelsea bloody, you know, terraced house. It's what ridiculous. do you think is going to happen in this city with, I mean, generally in cities in the West, you know, the, uh, there was some stat that came out recently where it's like, you can't, there is no minimum wage job that can afford you a, a, like a one bed apartment in the US anymore or something like well, that. Well, you have the situation. Okay, this is one of my politically correct things. I've got to be really careful here, okay? Um, what we didn't realize was that the dual income family went from being an option to an obligation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, okay, I've got to be really careful here because people are getting what, what Rory's saying is that you know, women should get back in the house, I know exactly in the kitchen. Saying, yeah. I'm not saying that. The two people who introduced me to this concept are both women and both of unimpeachable, I think, feminist credentials. They're Elizabeth Warren, the, yeah, who's the course, Democratic... Yeah. Uh, I, I'm right of centre in the UK. I could never understand... I thought Elizabeth Warren was brilliant. Yeah. But for some reason, Americans, Pocahontas, as Trump called her, Americans didn't warm to her that at was, all. That was a bit of a But gap, I always yeah. thought she was absolutely fascinating. She made this point, and she wrote a paper, I think, called The Double Income Trap. Yep. The other person who I do know who used to talk about it a lot was Faye Weldon, right. who said it was a brilliant option when it first came along and it was fantastic for her, but it went from being an option now where if you are single, you cannot buy a house, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I've got friends who are single. There was someone in Canary Wharf who rents, who is a hospital consultant, okay, wow, wow. who cannot buy a flat. Right? right? Because now you even get further absurdity, which is if you go to Newcastle, I, my daughter was at Newcastle University, and the student area of Newcastle is Jesmond, which is like the Knightsbridge of bloody Newcastle. Okay. And you realise that four students can outbid a family. Yes, you said okay. about your old office, didn't you? And, yeah. yeah, so we were outbid. We were outbid. We, we couldn't move to the original office building because they decided they didn't want it to be offices for the fourth largest ad agency in Britain. They'd, rather, okay. have student They'd rather have students in there. Yeah. And I'm going, so effectively, your ability to share property and, and combine income, it's gone from being an option, which is, hey, that's great, we can get a second income in and we can, get, we can save a bit of money and buy a better house, yeah. to if you want a house... Forget about it unless you both work. Yeah. And as a consequence, OK, now, when I was a kid, and, you know, I'm in the Welsh borders, a working-class guy could support a family yeah. on one salary. You see okay? this, ironically, in Friedman's documentary, watch that on YouTube, about, you know, uh, work efficiency in New York in the 1970s. Well, well, one of the things it destroyed, interestingly, was labour force mobility, because in America in the 50s, guy in New York who got an offer of, you know, a better job in California 
off you went, right? Yep. Now, both of you have to find a job in the new place. The only place where both of you can maximise opportunity is in the middle of a mega city, a New York, a Los Angeles, you know, maybe a Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it's much more difficult to live in a suburban place or to say, you know, a single guy can move to Newcastle and actually have a much better life because yep. even if he's paid less, he actually gets a house to live in and yep. stuff, right? Very, very difficult for two people to move simultaneously. You've really got to synchronise that. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's piece, she makes the interesting point, which never occurred to me, but it's actually not bad financial advice, OK? Now, I shouldn't say this, but she said, don't go and buy the most expensive of house you can afford, OK? Buy a cheaper house and spend your money on, well, she doesn't say this literally, like hot tubs and Versace hats and extravagances. Yeah. OK, well, that's terrible financial advice, isn't it? And she said, no, Elizabeth Warren said, because if you hit financial, uh, financial rocky patch, you can stop heating the hot tub and you can stop buying the Versace underpants, but you're stuck with your house. Right. You're stuck with your mortgage. And I thought it's just a really interesting take, which is... I'd never thought of that, which is that extravagance does give you optionality... Yeah, OK, whereas, uh, whereas property is a massive great commitment... Yes. ..which is actually a kind of albatross round your neck. I mean, our, our, the family advice for us was always buying a, a small house in a good area. Yeah, that's not bad, that's not bad advice. But, I mean, it's a, by the way, I don't think it's even legal to build micro-houses in London unless it's student accommodation, mm. OK? Well, there are a load of people who actually... What they'd like to do is move out of London to somewhere more sizable with a bit of space and then keep a foothold in London with what is effectively a tiny house. Yeah. And yet I don't think they you're all actually allowed now, to... You're, I don't think you're allowed to build them. That's all I'd buy. Yeah. I don't see any... You know, if I'm going to be in London, I'm going to do London things. I'm not going to pace around my library or drawing room, right? Yeah. I'm going to be out doing London things. Yes. So all I need is basically a crash pad and yet you're not allowed to build them. And, frankly, that's probably all people will be able to afford in cities like New York and London. Well, it's worse still because the property market, uh, the new build market, is optimised for two-bedroom apartments because they're great for buy-to-let investment, yep. OK? Um, and they're also great for overseas buyers, OK? They're terrible for a family. You can't actually, once you're in a two-bedroom apartment, if you have two children of two different genders, you've basically got to move out. Wow. So when you think about it, the whole what's being built is optimised not for the inhabitants of London, it's being optimised for rent-seeking investors, really. And I suppose we'll have to pick up on the decline of sort of family building in people my age, but that, that seems like a symptom I of mean, it. I mean, well, th there is a solution, which is you create a, re you create a suburb, OK, with suburban housing, but you don't let people over 35 move there. And so you create a really... OK, I'll let you into, I think, a bit of a secret, which is one of the reasons Brits love moving to Los Angeles, right, is you can live in suburbia, but it's still cool. Yeah. OK? Because New, New Los Angeles accommodation housing is suburban, well, right? Well, Richard Burton said okay. endless suburb. Endless suburb, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And actually, no-one thinks it's uncool to move to Los Angeles and go and, you know, move into sort of, you know, somewhere just off... Um, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you, you move to Wonderland or, or the, that valley thing or whatever, OK? Totally cool to live in a suburban house in Los Angeles with a pool, OK? If you do that in Surrey, you know, or you do that in Connecticut, not very cool. No. And in Surrey, you'd, you'd get sort of eyes from the neighbours, wouldn't mm. you? So, mm. um, do you need us done, Anna? Yep. What so, do I need to do next? Is there something? <laughs> I've got to go home, have I? This is, as we said, didn't we, this is Rory's uh, left break. Do I have something break? this evening? Do I have a late thing this evening? Or is that cancelled? There was something in the diary. That might be tomorrow. That might be tomorrow. I'll go and see. But um, this has been, I mean, it's been really... I mean, but that question of the dual income, it's, it's wonderful, because it's, it's a fur line trap, OK? It starts off as an option, and it's totally desirable, because if you want to earn two incomes, you can. What's now happened, this is why I'm very sympathetic with the four-day week and flexible work, is every single family has lost... 35 hours of discretionary time a week, OK, at the unit of the family, without really gaining in wealth at all. Who's gained? Government loves it because they get two lots of taxes rather than one, yeah. OK? Property owners love it because now your property price has gone up. Yeah. But effectively, most of the increase in earnings through having two earning, two earning people in a household rather than one has been mopped up by property and transport costs and the actual increase in, the, in your ability to make discretionary purchases has hardly improved at all. So it's a massive loss of discretionary time. Well, I suppose we'll have to end on a dark note then. That is a dark we'll note. Pick this but, up but next time. Don't shoot the messenger. It's Faye Weldon and Elizabeth Warren, OK? Right, we'll I'm, not, I'm not suggesting we should reverse this. <laughs> yeah.
um, at all. Um, in fact, I think we, I go further as a feminist, as a really extreme feminist. I think men should stay at home entirely, you know, doing light household tasks and playing computer games and while games. while while their wives go off to run Goldman Sachs internationally. I like that would be my ideal solution. Okay. So you can't accuse me of any kind of. <laughs> well, you heard it here first, Rory Sutherland. <laughs> yeah. Everyone will be leaving on the mail side from Ogilvy tomorrow. Uh, Rory, thanks. Actually, again. if there's one really truth, men are a lot better at doing nothing, aren't we? If you want, want you someone think, to do nothing, <laughs> is that fair? Yeah. If you want someone to do nothing, you need a bloke. <laughs>